Welcome everybody to a training call for Sacred Self Healing members. Today I want to talk about a very interesting subject, the duality of darkness, a topic that we can hardly discuss in public. Uh, not because it's so special or because it's so dark <laughs> or anything like that, but mostly because it requires a certain fundamental understanding um, of energies and and how certain energetic states can be discerned, can be felt. You know, since the fundamentals of dark and light forces and also uh, a little bit of uh, the terminologies is very important that we understand what we're talking about. Uh, these are not words that are normally that you find in a normal sort of spiritual books. Uh, if you do, they're often slightly transfigured. So I want to um, differentiate here for you, offer you, you a way to contextualize darkness, discuss with you how a person can become dark, if that's anything you've ever heard before. So we'll illuminate that and how to deal with inner darkness and respectively the self-healing roadmap, yeah, how to navigate through darkness. So let me just start here with a question. What is your guys' experience with darkness? What is your understanding of darkness? How do you relate to darkness? What is that for you? For example, is there something that you fear, something that you see is outside of you that perhaps tries to come in, or something that you find inside of you, or something that exists <laughs> sort of on both ends? Yeah, Jesse, something that has to do with our ego addictions. <laughs> Yes, you are absolutely correct. Yeah, our <laughs> ego addictions. Why, why is that, Jesse? What is so What is so dark about our ego addictions? Hi there. Hey there. Well, it's it's just it's so hardwired and it's so habitual and it's just something that I'm, you know, I've been kind of progressing towards understanding more and more and it's just for me it's where you know the work is for me right now so it's just it's can be overpowering I had an incident this week and I knew what was coming it came and it happened and I worked so hard but it was still it was still so hard <laughs> so overpowering that that would be a word that you would use to describe darkness perhaps like something that pulls you into stuff that, well, I mean, you know, maybe habits or things that you uh, used to do or that you've already identified aren't good for you or whatever, right? So, but it's it has a quality to it where it seduces one. Is is that kind of how that felt? It, I'm trying to read between the lines here. Absolutely, yes. Experienced. So there's a seductive or t a temptation to it. Something that that makes us weak, and that can us that can overpower our better intentions, say, or our better knowing. I mean, and, and that's a very neutral way to put it. And I like I like how you say that because you know a lot of uh, a lot of us uh, judge darkness, and we use the words such as evil to describe darkness and you brought in a slightly more critical version here because you brought in yourself right <laughs> i mean there's a part in you when i hear this correctly yes and i think it's just you know going from a lighter more expansive place to a darker constricting place for me right now it's it's ego and i know that everybody's journeys are are different and that's just for me, that's where I'm seeing the darkness. It's just, you know, within myself and within the ego. I would like to take your sharing here, Jesse, as a, as a sticky note, okay? And uh, discuss whether ego equals darkness, yeah? 
uh, I would like to discuss that in a, in a few minutes because this is something that comes up a lot with darkness. Yeah, and it is very easy to see it that way. But there is some critical thoughts about this that I want to throw into that. I'm, I'm already warning you. Not all ego is dark. Okay, so there is a bit of uh, discernment needed here on, on um, you know, perhaps uh, understanding really uh, the, the purpose and meaning of ego. And then we can also understand that not all of it is dark. Some of it is needed. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I like how you said that. Yeah, it's like everything that pulls you into that place that is restrictive or, um, well, I guess uh, just not as good as you could be, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it pulls us into a place where we show up uh, in a way that we know we could do better, something like that. It creates a conflict in us, right? It's like we do something and yet we know uh, perhaps that it's not the right way or it's not the better way or um, it's maybe a selfish way or something like that. So let's just take note of this here right now. I love that you bring, make, uh, make this connection with ego yeah, because that we're going to talk a lot about ego here. And you're right, everybody's journey is different and everybody's ego is slightly different. Yeah, so um, what one experiences or um, regards as dark might not uh, feel that dark for another person. So we always need to keep that in mind, just in general. Yeah, Julianne is sharing here, my darkness is what I deny in me, what I sweep under the carpet, what I judge as wrong, yeah, so yeah, you you you're referring to this confliction, this this inner conflict here when I know there's a choice and I do the opposite. Uh-huh. I like that. So where part of you wants one thing and another part of you wants another thing. It's like the the this juxtaposition of uh, like say wisdom versus desires. Yeah, that's a good way to describe that conflict. What else is your is your experience with darkness, inner or outer? I mean, there are some clear characteristics of darkness that we that we will cover here in a few minutes. Uh, but even the, the simplistic way of looking at darkness, what comes up for you? <laughs> Heather is sharing, I have a dark sense of humor sometimes. Yes, Heather. Thank you. Uh huh. And there's almost like, um, there was a juice in that. <laughs> Isn't there? Uh, sarcasm belongs into this category as well. Yeah. But let's all just uh, make this a confession here. You know, just like your experiences with darkness. Yeah. Has anyone experienced darkness in form of other people or in form of entities, perhaps? Becky's sharing. For her, darkness feels life degrading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh -huh. And Tether's also commenting here that she has a tendency to see her own mistakes. So just generally mistakes as a darkness yeah i would like to ask you by hand sign guys who of you has ever experienced this what heather just described to see your own mistakes or maybe flaws yeah may i ex expand mistakes and uh, into flaws and also perhaps failures yeah so mistakes flaws or failures imperfections as darkness, who in my hand is risen, sees, you know, these imperfect or things that you can't love about yourself that you see as mistaken or flawed or imperfect as darkness. 
Yeah, guys, this is almost all of you. This is um, very, very common. Yeah, it's very, very common to uh, have a sort of a simplistic view of good and bad, and therefore, you know, sort of classify everything uh, that is not good as bad. And we will learn why this is a bit too simplistic. Yeah, and uh, when we go a little deeper uh, into discerning truths, we'll find out that you now just because something isn't perfect, or just because uh, something or somebody say makes a mistake, that by no means makes that person dark. Uh, Julianne is sharing here entities, yes, doing house clearings with things that move furniture. So, Julianne, you actually have experienced uh, sort of this this other realm okay the astral realm so poltergeists mm -hmm. and ghosts they belong yeah. into, into the category of lower astral beings um th there are some some descriptors here that i'm missing from all of you uh, but i'm sure that you will have some julian share with us i'm sure people are curious about this i mean all, most of us know those kind of entities only from movies well, what is the, the the main feeling? Um, and you, we don't have to let go into trying to prove anything here. I just want to talk about your perception. When you perceive that, when you perceive dark energies in form of, um, you know, like entities that are literally, you know, sort of manipulating your environment. What what does that invoke in you? What is the feeling that comes up when in the presence of such a force? Well, it, it's f fear. When I was about 13, we moved into a house and the room I was in was super cold, like it was chilly. Um, it was quite scary, actually. And the fear that was there. So and it's also cold, the scary. Towering. Yeah. I could blow fog and it's like a movie in winter time i could it would be so chilly um, and you live what, in a tropical climate right just, just well that that was sorry. in brisbane which is subtropical that's when we moved okay. there and i was um 13 years old when we moved from cairns um down there for about four years mm -hmm. and the house that we moved into um in the room things could move i had a dressing table which i had um you know jewelry box and crystals and a couple of things and little ornaments um in the morning i'd wake up if i could even sleep and that everything would be upside down and <laughs> moved which was really scary as a kid um books used to fall off bookshelves and it seemed to be just in my room but then things happened in the house too like a broken clock had um, hands on it. It needed a battery and it wasn't working. And the hands would just spin around. Um, okay, so like in the movies, huh? Like in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it, the telephone table dragged towards me when I was sitting on the floor. It was horrific as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, How did you and, resolve this? Just so to uh, take a, a little bit away from the tension here. Um, did you um, get I, somebody in the house I, to remove those entities or did you just move? No, we moved. Um, my parents um, experienced different things too, but they didn't tell me, but they also made me feel like I was imagining it, okay. um, which was really horrible for me because I felt like no one knew. I thought I was, I knew this stuff was happening. Um, but then when we moved out, my parents told me of really of things that happened with them, taps turning on, doors slamming shut. Um, it was pretty scary, but that for me, I started reading the Bible and sleeping with the Bible. I went to school and I went into the um, church, uh, into the library and into the religious section and started praying and reading the Bible. Okay, so that was uh, your inner guidance basically, they told you that? Yeah, to, to find stability or find uh, uh, something that empowers you instead of uh, uh, yeah. pulling you into the sphere. Mm -hmm. And so you, the, 
yeah. part of myself, yeah, that would protect me because I felt very um, afraid. Yeah, so afraid was a word that I was looking at, at here. I was expecting to hear that first thing, mm. you know, because and most of yeah, that I had overpowered by something that was yes taking yeah. over. Yeah. So in whatever way, right? I mean, it can it, it can be something that comes from the inside as well as something from the outside. Okay. Mm. Um, uh, since you've commented on denial earlier, right? For you, darkness is everything that you deny about yourself or that you sweep under the rug. Um, that's interesting. Uh, just for you personally here, Julianne, because you mentioned that a big part of your suffering experiencing this darkness was that your parents who, uh, who experienced something similar more or less denied you you know, that, uh, that confirmation. So you questioned yourself as a consequence, right? You questioned yourself and, um, you know, only to find out later that they've experienced these things too. Mm -hmm. So denial is a piece here for you, uh, since we are all on this journey of, of uh, self-discovery and self-healing, you know, in regards to our own uh, ego stuff. Okay, that uh, you probably, you know, that's that's also trauma related for you in this way. Yeah, so that's something just to keep in the back of your mind that when you get pulled into your own denial, all right, that uh, this uh, sort of on this very subconscious or unconscious, better say, less level uh, links you into those uh, experiences, you know? Because that's, uh, you know, that's what made you become more or less uh, good at uh, denying what you're seeing, you know. And sometimes uh, when we experience trauma as children, uh, this is the only way for us to survive psychologically, mm -hmm. to just simply deny that this is happening, you know. And if we don't uh, have parents or, or grown-ups around us that can help us, that talk to us about it, that acknowledge what we're seeing, even if they don't see it, but uh, that generally just help us to, to deal, to handle all of that that comes with that, um, the powerlessness, the, the fear and so forth. Uh, then we, we're speaking of trauma. Yeah, it's, an, it's an encapsulated um, sort of coping mechanism. And then we call this ego, okay? So here, uh, uh, already, so as a preparation, um, and the bridge between ego um, and trauma, okay, so there is a, a part of the, the ego's purpose is to help us deal with trauma, yeah, and let's not forget that. So we cannot quite say that um, ego is dark, yeah, it might not be the best way for us to handle things, but to a certain degree, it uh, provides uh, sort of the pure survival level of what we can do. And sometimes denial, um, uh, yeah, or um, you know, doing the things that we that we uh, or that helped us when we were children, um, uh, they then crystallize as our ego behavior because that's uh, what helped us back then. Okay. Yeah, so fear and uh, and the feeling of overpowered. Anything else, anything that... that thank you, Julian, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I hope you guys don't find this disturbing. I should have done a disclaimer here when we talk about darkness, especially when we go into the discussion of it and the experiences. Yes, we will hear things that might trigger fear in us, okay? But let's not forget that this... Uh, that the purpose of this workshop is to develop self-healing strategies. So uh, one of the way to form resilience and uh, ultimately uh, strategies that can help us to overcome our fears and this feeling of our overpoweredness requires us to look at it, requires us to deal with what is. I, I also later learned how to um, do house cleansings and to work with that sort of stuff as well. So I think that first experience. So you're no longer, so you're no longer powerless, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's really, it was really cool because I can see that that 
um, experience, I always looked back and thought, wow, you know, I couldn't see it at the time when I was 13, but it actually led me on a path of spiritual, you know, looking for answers in the Bible, wearing amulets around my neck um, and searching for what is that and what was that. And um, yeah, and later on, and I, I do, if I'm asked, I do house cleansings and I've worked with different things and seen different things that probably sound a bit scary, but it's like telling someone who's at your door, get out of my house. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And basically that's what it comes down to. And you know what, if you give something fear, you energize it. And what, and that, that, that entity, which was a, um, I, I realized later it was a male entity that was, stuck there um that entity was energized by my fear so you know i was the one who could see and um feel it and it just really harassed the hell out of me because it was getting energized through my fear and my um awareness of its existence you know yeah i mean this is this is already like a really advanced uh realization julian and we get we're gonna get to this uh but everybody listening please keep this in mind okay there is something very important about what julian just said yeah that there is an interaction okay there's an interaction um between us and darkness and that can either minimize or exacerbate darkness Okay, so it's dynamic, yeah. Uh, The part here that I find interesting about what you just shared, or that I find most interesting about what you just shared, Julian, is is this component that this experience somehow karmically, okay, brought you onto a path, okay, of exploring spirituality. I mean, if if you don't mind me sharing this uh, on your behalf, you are in our energy healer training, you're an acupuncturist. Okay, so you have a hands-on 3D job, okay? But, as you just said, you know, when people ask you, you will do this for them, you're not struck away from it. So there's a certain level of resilience that has formed through going, by going through these experiences and also interest. I mean, I can tell just by the way you talk about it that you face that, that you have worked with this. That you've dealt with the, with these kind of expressions, lower astral uh, forms of energy and entity entities, yeah, you've you've developed resilience. So there's a connection between trauma, ego, and karma. All right, we've just added another dimension here to our ego, and we'll see what the connection with darkness is in a little bit. Yeah, Jesse is sharing over the past few months, I've noticed that my big limitation is fear. Yes, Jesse. This is the biggest limitation that we all have as humans. And uh, what we can, uh, you know, identify as, yeah, I mean, the, the fundamental duality in all of us. Yes. So the fundamental duality in all of us, if we break it down to the core aspect is the fear of dying, the fear of loss. Yeah, and then layers upon layers of fear. Okay, the fear of losing a loved one, the fear of losing reputation or losing money or losing status quo or losing comfort zone or anything like this, all leads back to the original duality in us. And that is that we are experiencing ourselves as immortal souls, as immortal eternal consciousness. We don't put words to it in this way, but we are experiencing ourselves as formless consciousness in a mortal body. I have a seven-year-old who is just now going through the realization that he's going to die one day. Yeah. And this is a very interesting 
process that happens there in all of us where you know we begin to resist we begin to resist this fear and and the fact that we have to die and that produces a conflict in us and that conflict that duality guys is ultimately expressed in our ego the connection to our ego is that our ego is a fail safe mechanism yeah this is a psychological um fail safe mechanism that we have built in it ties into our nervous system to our five senses and to our cognition um but most and foremost it's controlled by our central nervous system and our amygdala the part in us that has that ability to react to things here as an example the famous example of the the, the lion chasing you the fight flight and freeze response that is determined or regulated by the amygdala the amygdala is a relatively ancient part of our brain it's not very highly developed it is uh, what we mostly call the animalistic part of us it's very primal okay and that taps directly into our central nervous system why because it needs to circumvent all our thinkingness and even our feelings because if a lion is chasing us our feelings our emotions and our thoughts can be in the way we have to just like get this adrenaline going and run yeah or hide or something like that we have to secure our physical survival first and foremost and then we can ha- we can allow ourselves the luxury of having emotions and thoughts about it so often when you, you, something was um more or less triggered through your your amygdala your animal the animalistic part of you you do something before you think and then you think later you guys know what i'm talking about right this is a part in our brain that does not connect to a higher thinking and i'm not even talking spiritual thinking i'm just talking about conceptual thinking to cognition where we can look at pros and cons where we can look at the consequences where we can look at uh, considerations such as good and bad or dark and light right these things do not come in the foreground in fact they get turned off when there is a threat to our life and the ego sits right on top of that as a piece of software almost okay that determines when something is a threat yeah so this is a bit um, more augmented version of what the ego actually is the ego is mostly perceived by us as something um selfish or uh, egotistical yeah as a word that that we use you know to describe so- certain social behaviors but from a pure psychological and neurological point of view the ego is actually an extremely important part of our own survival mechanism it's it's pro it's instinctual it's primal um it's regulated or it regulates our central nervous system there's nothing in the world that we can do to stop it okay we can however and this is the, the part here that comes in with consciousness work and mindfulness and so forth learn to regulate it better okay and we can work with our ego in regards to um, how it decides whether something is a threat or not okay so that here you know sort of carried uh with us on the sideline okay uh from a pure physiological standpoint ego is an extremely important psychological fail safe it allows us to survive severe trauma severe threat uh any kind of situations that you know compromise our actual physical existence yeah so that's the most neutral definition of ego but you already see that there is a problem with that because if our higher thinking our conceptual thinking 
that allows us to make sense of things, that allows us to evaluate whether it's a good or a bad behavior, whether it is beneficial for myself, whether it's healthy or whether it's good for the people that I'm with or, you know, whether the consequences of a certain choice perhaps outweigh the risks and so forth. That part is not involved when this primal part, this, this sub ego survival part in us gets turned on. And trauma is defined by um, this kind of trigger, okay? Which means that in a trauma situation, we uh, need to be very grateful that we have something like an ego because it actually allows us to psychologically and often also physically um, do the right things okay just so we can get by just so we can survive we have to deal with the consequences later but first we have to physically survive because without our physical survival there is no need to worry about anything you know with that anyways it just sort of the, for the for the simplicity of or the simpleness of that okay the only problem is when we never really work with our trauma and uh, leave it as is and begin to rely on these these ego mechanisms fight flight or freeze unchecked and continue to use it to live our life that way as basically as a as, a, as an approach to life as a way of looking at life as a way of you know uh, uh, interacting with other people then um, we will find out that ego in and of itself is extremely limited, extremely restrictive, and yes, Jesse, based on fear. Ego in and of itself is fundamentally fear-based. It is fundamentally based on scarcity and lack, and the threat of losing something, be it our life, or be it our status, or be it you know our uh, you know physical integrity or our health or whatever so we have to understand that the, that ego in and of itself is a duality okay that is needed at some points but that also if left unchecked can become overpowering can become restrictive can become limiting for us and you see the slide here on the screen it says duality of darkness and that's where i would like to go with you today namely uh, how can there be a duality about darkness because we just you know brought examples for darkness and they all seem to be bad you know bad in a very simplistic way i mean they they can be scary fearful limiting overpowering uh, seductive, uh, uh, you know, make us deny ourselves, uh, perhaps even our own uh, needs, our own wants, uh, and so forth. So there's a, there's a lot of problems with darkness. So why is there a duality? What could there be good about darkness? Uh, duality always means there's two sides of it. Yeah, and um, just explore this with you here today. Heather is sharing. Other people's darkness affect me mental health issues and others, lies, deceit, overpowering me, treating me like I'm less than them. Yes, very beautiful description of what the presence of darkness actually feel, subjectively feels like. Yes, and you've pinpointed this uh, uh, very uh, accurately that when other people have mental health issues, meaning when like say their uh, behaviors or their approaches to life or their perception is off yeah or um, is uh, so limited through the uh, disease or disorder that they have that when we are in close contact with them and this counts particularly for parents uh, family members and and uh, partners, spouses, then this can have a detrimental effect on us. It can feel very dark for us because these things that we could normally expect from 
uh, these more intimate relationships, yeah, a connection somehow, empathy, um, sort of a goodwill, um, forms of unconditionality, forms of generosity and tenderness and so forth. Uh, we, we can't get that from people who suffer from certain conditions. Yeah, and there's obviously different degrees and uh, the, you know, scales, all right? So, um, you know, there's syndromes, uh, you know, that are not actual, um, uh, say, disorders, yeah, but syndromes such as ADHD, for example, ADD, attention deficit. Yeah, so even if you look at the attention deficit as a sort of a mental health challenge, okay, there is no maliciousness or actual darkness in a person who um, experiences ADHD or ADD, but it can be socially impacting and limiting for the people that are around this person, okay, because uh, perhaps uh, due to the lack of focus or due to the hyperactivity, it's very difficult uh, to make connection with this person. It was very difficult to to tap into feelings and uh, to be emotionally available, to feel emotionally safe with that person. Okay, so that's just one example of, for a very common mental health challenge nowadays. Um, more severe cases are autism, for instance, and, um, you know, really restricting often temporary conditions such as depression and anxiety, clinical depression, clinical anxiety in a person that we love, that we live with, uh, can be extremely impacting for us. And it can feel very, very dark when we are with uh, a person who suffers from depression or who suffers from anxiety or you know, other disturbances uh, and, and behavioral issues such as OCD, for instance. Yeah, um, th then uh, th there are uh, mental health challenges that um, are a bit more permanent and um, also more sort of um, <clears throat> psychopathic, okay, such as personality disorders, okay, where a person literally experiences, the person that suffers from it, uh, literally experiences a lack of sense of self and uh, sometimes that can turn into I guess uh, the most uh, most prominent example is uh, you know, switching personalities yeah where you you speak with this person uh, one moment they're like this and then the next moment they're like this or mood disorders uh, a different class of disorders but um, <clears throat> you know, personality disorders can be very disturbing um, because you never really feel safe with that person. Um, and then ultimately, of course, uh, sociopathic um, behavior, antisocial behavior, or, um, you know, true psychosis uh, or temporary neurosis, neurosis, uh, those kind of things. Uh, when one experiences that as a bystander, okay can be very traumatic it can be very traumatic not just disturbing or limiting it can be very traumatic to be in the presence of a person that shows these severe uh, mental health um, challenges or issues so thank you heather for bringing this in this is very important to understand that uh, what we describe as darkness uh, isn't just uh, like this extreme example that Julianne made or shared here with us where there was an actual uh, foreign entity. Um, there are uh, crossovers obviously here between like say personality disorder or psychopathic or sociopathic behaviors and entities and there's a lot of discussion and a controversy um, if there is uh, something like a possession or a walk-in situation. Um, that if, if you ask questions about that, I will answer them, but uh, uh, I don't want to make this the, the topic here today. Yeah, so how, why do we experience darkness as a duality? Let's examine this. So uh, the first uh, part here is always to define something. So let's define what we're talking about. We're talking about um, something that uh, you described um, as um, 
uh, an inner or an outer state. So uh, darkness can be caused by a person, place or energy, entity or an inner state. So it can be something on the outside, a place like a house or um, a street or um, even a whole entire city can feel dark to us um, as well as a, a building yeah, or a house. Uh, it can be an item that can feel very dark. It can be a person, yeah, and we're not looking at why, okay, but it can be caused uh, by all these different uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of subjects, okay, that are outside of us, uh, including energies or entities. But it can also be part of an inner state, okay. Um, then uh, darkness is in generally in general defined uh, th through a real or perceived absence of light. Okay, that would be sort of a duh answer. So whatever is dark, you know, um, uh, means that there's not enough light there. So there's an absence of light um, or a connection to light, which um, is more sort of the spiritual perspective where we can say, okay, um, you know, even with the sunlight okay it's not always uh, bright and shiny out uh, we also have cloudy days or we have night times and there is a temporary um, deficiency of light or there is a temporary absence of light um, that can still be described as a darkness in the most neutral sense um, if we go into the more personal aspect of that then we can recognize or personal and energetic aspect is we can identify darkness as a state as an energy field or as an entity that deprives a person of their life force and associated abilities that come with life force so in other words you call this limiting or restricting yeah so when darkness is present it is harder to access the, these abilities that we have that come with the connection to light, okay? The ability to step into our own power, the uh, ability for clear thinking, okay? The ability to make our own stance uh, and defend ourselves, uh, the ability to control our own behaviors. Um, anything that, you know, we would, I think, who said this earlier, uh, that darkness feels that it's life degrading. Becky, I think you said that, right? It's, it's somehow robbing you of your life force in that sense. Okay, so these definitions here are very neutral definitions of darkness, just so that we really understand what we are really talking about. And when defined this way, we can find out that, you know, whatever we perhaps judge as dark may not necessarily be dark, okay? And sometimes what we just simply define as a bad habit or, yeah, like Jesse said in the beginning, uh, like some kind of eco addiction, yeah, um, might be quite dark. We don't know this yet. We have to look at what it does, how it affects us, how it affects others, and how it relates to our ability to connect. Because for as long as we have the ability to connect to light, we can always find back to it. True darkness doesn't just impair the connection to light, it destroys it or tries to completely cut it off. Yeah, And therefore, uh, when we talk about dark entities, uh, we also have to differentiate between, you know, what they do and also uh, their power. Like, not all entities have the power to destroy the connection to the light, okay? So that's, you know, when we go further into terminology and when we want to talk about dark entities, you got to understand that there are entities out there, such as lower astral entities, the kind that Julianne shared with us here, 
that don't actually have a lot of power. They may be able to uh, mess with uh, solidity, yeah, uh, telekinesis, um, and, and move things around, okay, but for one, and this counts for all dark entities, just to answer that question up front, they cannot manifest into 3D. They cannot become solid themselves, okay? And um, they really oftentimes, yeah, even though they uh, induce fear, they use, you know, fear or overpowering as mechanisms to manipulate us, to make us do things such as, well, most poltergeists actually want us to get out of that space. Uh, it's like a warning, yeah, that we should move away from this place, and this is then ultimately what most people do. Yeah, um, rightly so. Uh, because why would you want to deal with that? Now, whether or not these astral forces exist, I don't want to discuss this right now, but there is lots of evidence uh, that uh, and, and witnesses and so forth, uh, millions of, of those testimonials that report about those kind of entities. From an energetic point of view, um, poltergeists and ghosts are low astral uh, entities because they are caught in this in-between world. They're in between 3D and not 3D, if you so will. And uh, they're kind of sad in that way. They're they're like uh, etheric junk. It's like an etheric junkyard. The forgotten souls, if you will, they cannot quite cross over. And so they are captured themselves. Uh, they're quite sad. It's, 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 it's like purgatory to a certain degree because uh, they, they cannot go either way. Okay, that's why we call them lower astral energies because they're actually lower, don't have much power. Uh, they, they think they think they are still alive. So they have an unhealthy attachment to the 3D um, and that binds them to the realm, but that still doesn't make them solid. Right. Any questions about lower astral energies? Because this is your opportunity to ask questions about these things because yeah, they relate to our topic here but they're not the main subject lower astral okay has anybody ever experienced uh, etheric entities it's not judge them dark or light uh for now uh that feel more powerful than that not necessarily more fearful but more powerful than that has anybody ever experienced a force, yeah, be it in a dream state, in a vision, or in a wake state, um, maybe in an uh, altered state of consciousness, lucid dreaming. Okay, so let's examine those. Let's just talk about this so that we can take the fear out of all of this, not to minimize it, but to not sweep it under the rug, okay? Here is one person who says yes. Okay. Yeah, that was me. Um, that was quite a few years ago. And, and probably there have been a few in between, but this is probably the one that was um, it just, just really I don't know what to say, but it definitely wasn't normal. And sound. how did you feel that force? I mean, did you feel this as a sense? Did you have a sensory impact? Did it make you feel things in your body? Did it make you um, did oh, it influence actually, your emotions oh, or your thoughts? How it's did, interesting. How did you feel it? It's interesting because as soon as I said yes and I started talking, all the other ones came up at the same time. So even before that, there was one even stronger than that and i could feel it physically and i could feel it trying to come into my room okay and because i had taken a brave stand for something mm -hmm. 
and that force or whatever it was was very upset and angry okay. and, so that's, and an, that's an emotional impact right so you felt it physically the, the presence uh, of it but yes. the, the upsetness you felt that emotionally mm -hmm. and you know I'd gotten that far and took a stand and was courageous and I'm like wow I must have really pissed something off, something off uh, pretty bad I'm laughing now because but at the time I don't think I was and but I knew that something had shifted because I took a stand and so it was like a bit like putting a hole in a fence and going through it kind of thing and well, putting your stake in that, that I prefer that visual <laughs> putting your stake in and saying nope that's mine yeah Stop something like that a making a stance yeah. for yourself I did, I did, and then about a year after that, like it just was one after another, like within a period of about two years, and it just kept getting, and I, I did like Julian, where my investigation and, and, you know, I, I did some work as well in clearing spaces and doing some research in that regard around the same time so it was a bit ironic really because around that time then i was having a nice little nap <laughs> they always like to get you when you're doing a nice little nap but for me that's anyway it doesn't matter that's a sidebar and it was like there was somebody at the door and then nobody at the door it was half dream half awake and then then they got it's, I mean, it's been described before where they go into your body and then I couldn't move. I was numb, couldn't get up, couldn't wake up. I was completely numb. Like paralysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's and, very con that's a very common experience in this half yeah. awake, half asleep state. And there Plus might be, I mean, nothing major. It was just, I mean, mm -hmm. these things happen to people. We just, we don't talk about them. That's all. Well, that's why we talk about them. Okay. Um, that's exactly why I want you to share these things. Thank you. Justine for sharing that okay so there's an experience there that clearly makes you feel overpowered that clearly makes you feel intruded somehow okay but you've also experienced yourself uh, being able um, you know to drive it away yeah so let, let's just let's just keep it here okay these are the kind of experiences that I want you to to tap into to share because uh, if you actually knew how many people have those kind of experiences, uh, you would uh, feel much more normal, quote unquote, about yourself. Okay, so this is, thank you, Justine, for, for sharing that. Okay, this is a very common experience, especially for people who are energetically sensitive. And especially for those of us uh, who actually train that state, that lucid state, yeah, through mindfulness and meditation because that is a state in which we can traverse multiple realms at the same time we can be 3d we can be connected to our bodies right feel our bodies uh, i don't know if anyone ever had this experience where you lay there and you have asleep have not to sleep any but you hear yourself snoring anybody raise your hand anybody ever heard yourself snoring <laughs> Like, yes, okay, this is almost all hands, yeah. It's like, this is a 3D experience, or oh, your senses are still functioning, okay? But, you know, so you, and your awareness is fully there. You could have sworn up and down that you were fully awake, okay? But your body was <laughs> kind of on autopilot there, okay? Uh, same with, uh, or similar with hypnosis. Anybody ever had hypnosis where, and it's really uh, no there's no reason to be afraid of hypnosis when it's done right uh, because you are in possession of your all your senses you're fully there okay it's just that uh, uh, the the person who facilitates it, the hypnosis is able to help you to stay in that in between space okay so that is a, a, a cool thing and here at transcodes we practice those things with the energy awareness training uh, like this weekend on Sunday, we have the energetic visioning um, intensive. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the uh, energetic protection, the etheric protection intensive, where we train those things. We train encounters with 
entities who train how to do this right, uh, how to do visioning right without getting overpowered or scared by those kind of experiences that um, just team just shared. Okay, so uh, what is the meaning of them, you might ask? Well, I mean, some of it has to do with um, the, the, the keyword paralysis. Okay, so your body is in a state of uh, autopilot and uh, you're not hovering above you like they show it in the movies, but you know, your, your awareness is more separated from your body. And that means that you can actually witness your body. You can, you can experience and observe your body at the same time. And also your awareness, your consciousness about that. In those states, we are indeed tapping into higher levels of consciousness and sometimes also other dimensions of awareness. Okay, so this is maybe a little far-fetched for some of you, but um, we all know that uh, some of our perception isn't just based on our five senses. We all know that and you guys are all energetically sensitive. You've classified yourself, so to speak, as an energetically sensitive. And energetically sensitive call themselves that because they do have quite a bit of that uh, extra sens sensory experience in their life. But it is less mystical than you think it is because psychology can actually explain it and neuroscience, okay? So there are states that are uh, linked to the, the brain frequency that, uh, and this is common to all of us humans, so we can train that, there, it can be systematically be done, you can do research uh, with it. Okay, so certain brain frequencies in which we can tap into different states of consciousness. And so it happens that uh, when we tap into these uh, states of consciousness by accident, yeah, like usually when we take naps or when we meditate, uh, that we can get overwhelmed by what we're, but by the sensory experience that we have there, which doesn't always account for uh, dark uh, forces or, or entities being present. Um, the main thing about this experience of uh, something dark here, again, leading back to this one uh, uh, state or emotion that it awakes in us, namely fear, has to do with the unknown. So we have to understand that and here comes the ego in back, back in, um, that our ego recognizes anything that is unknown as a threat to survival. That is not a very sophisticated differentiation. Our ego just sees everything that is unknown as potentially threatening. And therefore, you know, psychologically, we are a bit hesitant, we are reluctant to explore the unknown. And the ultimate unknown for all of us, just on a side note here, is future, okay? Which is why we can easily get caught into our ego coping mechanisms when it comes to making decisions for our future because the future in and of itself is unknown to all of us. Yeah, so uh, here just for you guys, sometimes struggling with some of your ego uh, addictions or coping mechanisms popping up, when you're in a life situation where uh, you don't know what to do or where you uh, experience uh, some kind of threat you know, say, you know, losing a job or losing a loved one or losing money. Um, it is uh, very normal, very human to be pulled into your ego coping mechanisms because that increases the fear of the unknown. Okay. But all that said, uh, just to make it uh, more aware to you why uh, I often talk about this and just so you know, there are three videos on my YouTube channel. One is called Dark Forces, one is called Light Forces, and one is called Angels Angels and Demons, uh, where I address this, uh, the, the different entities and what they do and the power that they have in a bit more detail. All right, so it's like six hours of, uh, you know, like looking into these different realms and answering people's questions. But um, all that, you know, doesn't mean that dark forces aren't there. So there are dark forces there. 
and uh, we've uh, started to define them a little bit. I want to help you now without uh, going into the hierarchy of uh, the different power that entities have, because most of you don't have that experience yet or will never have that experience. Uh, that you have to differentiate, that you have to discern how powerful is this entity at all? Is this even a threat? Okay, so let's just examine the nature of these dark forces, yeah, and what they do and how they can be overpowering and limiting and seductive for us. All right, and here's where we come back to the beginning. Again, what we perceive as dark. Yeah, so there's this, there's the fear, there's the seduction, there is the limitation. And there's one aspect that uh, we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, it's also seductive, but it is something that uh, can happen to us uh, with uh, the good and the bad. And that is uh, curiosity, mesmerization. Any one of you ever been really mesmerized by darkness um yeah uh, there is uh, this is the reason why we have horror movies okay horror movies uh, fulfill a very important psychological function for people namely to give them the illusion that they are facing their fears they're actually not they, they play on the mesmerization of the dark and uh, that's uh, also where we have to be a bit careful because that's a seductive element of our ego uh, to be mesmerized by something, yeah, I think it's cool <laughs> somehow, yeah, um, and uh, therefore stay with things longer than we should, okay, uh, it's also why people start slowing down when there's a car accident and when there's uh, people injured and stuff like that, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, graphic stuff and there is a part in us yeah, that um, that kind of feeds on that, that has it, that gets some kind of juice, some kind of ego juice out of that. And you have to understand, guys, that that's not dark. That's human, okay? Because we have that mesmerization with things that we see, even if they're like really gross or really scary or um, uh, really sort of uncomputable. Uh, uh, for us, okay, so uh, that's something that, uh, you know, in psychology uh, can often, you know, lead to actually mental illness uh, when people uh, get too mesmerized, when they get too sucked into that, th that juice, yeah, that we get out of the grossness of things, okay, so uh, my way of calling that is, oh, uh, uh, when you stare at the abyss for too long, yeah, the abyss starts staring back at you. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what this refers to. It actually refers to the, the Lord of the Rings. Um, um, a book uh, or, or movie trilogy. Yeah, that is uh, basically saying that there is something about darkness that is seductive to us. Yeah, uh, because uh, in our fear, there's also uh, this um, this drive to somehow uh, um, harness it. Yeah, can you feel what I am referring to? This is uh, very important that we become aware of that. Yeah, Julian, it has to do with what we fear we want to know, as you say here. Uh, it, it's 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 a little deeper than that. Um, is it because it then becomes known? Well, um, n not really, because, uh, you know, there are certain levels of darkness that we simply cannot know, okay? Um, because as humans, um, uh, we cannot quite uh, compute, we cannot process uh, the absence of, of humanness unless there is a, a mental illness. Uh, that we have. So um, it's more, um, the word mesmerization is the best word. It, or, you know, sometimes uh, people say curiosity killed the cat. It refers to that drive. There's a drive in us to explore 
and uh, to wanting to harness something. Uh, it's yes, it, it relates to us wanting to know. And for many of us uh, intellectual and mental people, uh, this can be quite a bit of an ego trap, okay, to wanting to know everything about something without discerning whether it's even good or bad, you know, whether it's even good for us. Yeah, what uh, is the use of you uh, knowing um, every single gross detail uh, about something, okay, if uh, it really traumatizes you? Uh, by doing that, all right. So uh, this is a, this uh, discernment piece in us, you know, where we have to uh, pay attention to what it actually makes us feel. And if something makes us feel powerless, if something makes us feel scared, if something makes us feel restricted, okay, then it's a sure sign that it's actually not good for us. Yeah. So just so you know, that is uh, the, the, the simple truth of, uh, um, you know, paying attention to what we pay attention to. Uh, the aspect that Julianne brought up earlier with um, our fear feeding some of these dark entities is very real. But let me um, differentiate dark forces for you because uh, this is probably the easier way to understand things without having to go too much into uh, uh, s certain spiritual directions or, or schools, or mystic schools, or or anything you know like that, yeah, lore uh, or esotericism. Uh, <laughs> dark forces can be uh, differentiated into two main types of darknesses yeah that's why the subtitle of this workshop was um the, the two darknesses okay and <clears throat> how can we see them so most people uh, no matter what religion they're from historically uh, and it, this is reflected in our in our uh, languages at least here is sort of in our western uh, languages indo-germanian uh, languages that, that uh, all sort of more or less uh, find their roots in uh, in the Persian, in the Hebrew, uh, in the Roman Greek, obviously, and also some of the Egyptian uh, civilizations. Okay, talk about Satan as sort of the anti, the anti uh, entity, the anti entity to to the light, to the divine. Okay. If one does a little bit of uh, linguistic examination, uh, then we'll find that uh, there is, you know, a very strong distinction between these dark forces and these um, opponents, if you will, of God. Okay, they're not all the same. So in our languages, uh, it's different in, in each of our languages, but there's often sort of throwing them all into one pot. Okay, and we call this, uh, you know, what we perceive as sort of anti-God, as uh, satanic, okay, as uh, uh, devilish, okay, if you will. So this uh, personification of, uh, you know, whatever is sort of anti-God, uh, as the devil, yeah, the, the the one that we see. How do we see the devil, guys? Uh, give me a heads up here. I don't want to be the only one speaking. What is it, the most common way of, of seeing the devil or Satan? What, what are some of these, these pictures that we carry in our heads that we see in the movies over and over again? Who wants to share? What is the most sort of archetypal uh, way of looking at, uh, at sort of a, a, a devilish uh, or de demonic uh, type of, of entity? How do we associate them? <laughs> yes, red body, horns with a pitchfork. Uh-huh, that's right, Heather. And fire, uh-huh, yeah. Anything else? That's probably the most uh, sort of archetypal way. Beast with a pitchfork, yep. Beastish, uh-huh, 
yeah so there's themes right that come up in 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 different um in different cultures different religious backgrounds um that depict the dark uh in this sort of beastish form uh sometimes half human uh sometimes not human at all uh with horns uh red eyes yeah fire uh-huh. yeah yeah and julian is hinting here at something uh so it's it's a, an animalistic form of something so uh, what people usually describe as satanic yeah here with those two horns and so forth it, that's a term that actually comes from the persian from right around 600 bc okay so uh, in the persian in uh, uh, culture uh, times uh, the times where the saratustra times uh you know it it was the first time that there was an actual sort of anti-god okay formed in in people's minds yeah so until then um and even to, to a certain degree in in the egyptian uh, uh culture okay there were multiple gods and uh, it wasn't really until this time i mean the egyptians actually started that Uh, to unify all gods into one sort of divine entity that rules them all and sort of the anti player to it okay so yeah we find this in the egyptian culture as well um but uh, it wasn't until the you know the the persian times uh, uh that you you had this like sort of duality of of the good guy and the bad guy okay and if you uh, really look into this I'm reading your comments here as I'm speaking. Um it interrupts me a little bit. It's always easier if you actually speak into the microphone. Yeah, so there's uh, the lower there's the there's the Christian version of that uh, uh which describes uh, Lucifer as the fallen angel, right? Uh that used to be sort of one of God's favorites, quote unquote, and then lost favor, lost the grace of God and uh Yeah, did what? Guys, what what did Lucifer do? According to the lore, according to um the rendering of of the Old Testament. I mean, sometimes Lucifer is also called the light bringer. How can we explain all this? Let's dive into this here. for a few minutes what these words even mean what they bring forward yeah hello it's Hi. like a, it's like the expression of lucifer like to know itself there's darkness and light so for the experience it's like two reflections two mirrors there's a dark mirror and the light mirror so darkness is not dark and light is not light they're two um forms that have been expressed outward from the one okay um so is that based on on the old testament right now what you were saying what is the source of that? or is that your personal rendering or your personal understanding Um, um, of, my, of personal understand, my personal okay. understanding of light and dark like so Lucifer's God's right hand man <laughs> to yeah, show that light yeah. so when we can see our dark when we know what our darkness is we know what light is and they we're either running away from darkness or chasing light but we're neither uh-huh. okay so what you are pointing at here Julian and very rightly so uh is the duality of that right so something ain't right about the simplistic way of looking at, at light and dark as the good guys and and bad guys yeah or the good guy and the bad guy so there might be another uh, third option here but let's stick with the the uh, normal sort of uh, stereotypical way of looking at dark and light and especially the forces that come with that Yeah so let's assume we all have somewhat of a of a 
of a, a form here for uh, the, the good guy, okay, God or the divine or the source, the intelligence that uh, uh, brought uh, us into creation and, and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the whole universe. Okay, so that's the light, the light, yeah, let's just call, let's just call it that way. Do we all agree on that definition of, of a light force? Yeah, or the light force, the good guy, okay, God, divine. Yeah, you guys all okay with that? I mean, I <clears throat> no one assume that this is how you see that, but um, this is the most stereotypical way, okay? No objections, okay. Um, and then we somehow also experience the opposite of that, the, the bad guy, okay? and. Uh, uh, for for Christians, the bad guy is uh, uh, somehow, and the, the, the terminology here is not very clear. Um, sometimes called Satan, sometimes called Lucifer. Actually, never really called Lucifer. Okay, so we have to uh, make a bit distinction here. I don't want to go into semantics of that, but um, uh, in my experience, most people just call anything that is sort of bad guyish, <laughs> yeah, sort of anti-godish. Uh, uh, satanic or or luciferian so when we hear about those uh, cults or whatever blood cults or you know the uh, that uh, sort of worship satan okay uh, then we have this this picture in our head that uh, that they are um, worshiping sort of the 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 anti-god Right? Can, can I? Can we agree on on seeing things in this simplistic way for now? Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks for the feedback. This is really important, guys, because I don't want to just impose a certain views on you. I want you to to do this inquiry with me so that you can come to your own conclusions, to your own insights. All right. Obviously, I am presenting something to you here. Uh, that already went through a, a bunch of uh, sort of processing and, and discerning. But it's very important that you also understand why, okay? And that you can follow the steps yeah, uh, that I am showing you here. I would be a bad teacher if I did not show you the steps, how I got there, okay? Uh, good teaching always allows the student to follow each every, and every step by him or herself. Okay, so <clears throat> that is how most people see it, uh, sort of all just in this dualistic way, good and bad, a good guy, bad guy. Um, what we do know uh, from philosophy, from um, uh, esotericism and uh, uh, theological studies is that there uh, are that it's not that easy even within uh, the, uh, the Christian or Hebrew or um, uh, 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 Muslim uh, or Hindu uh, the Vedic uh, traditions it's it's much more complex uh, it, uh, we see different uh, characteristics assigned to different kinds of dark entities and there are dark, uh, different dark entities and, and hierarchies. Um, but the main forces here, when we look at dark and light, uh, can be summarized as two main dark forces. One would be the, the kind that we all know as the Lucifer that uh, Julien just brought in. Uh, something like a right uh, wing man, a, a first officer or something uh, that somehow fell from grace, at least according to the to, to scripture, uh, and went out and started uh, to form its own kingdom. Okay, so some like a split, there's a split, a separation that happened. And, uh, uh, you know, from uh, being an angel to uh, a demon or from being, you know, sort of a, a part of the divine uh, uh, faction, okay, uh, to forming um, uh, his own faction. And that is something very important to understand about Lucifer and the Luciferian type of darkness, because the Luciferian type of darkness is the kind of darkness that splits off from 
the divine and tries to create its own kingdom, its own realm. Why is this important to make this distinction? Because when we start discussing the ego's role in conjunction with darkness, we will recognize that our ego has aspects of that. There are many discussions and uh, uh, topics that uh, we've illuminated where we came to the conclusion that there is a part of our ego that indeed actually tries to put itself over God. There's a part in us that wants to, well, you know, that contradicts uh, sort of creation and uh, nature and all that, that wants to dominate it, that wants to have its own sort of realm, its own kingdom, even if it's just our own sort of little selfish microcosm, okay, but it makes us feel like we can be our own God, okay? This is the, the psychology uh, behind the Luciferian. That is the kind of force that pulls us away from creation into an outer realm, into another realm, okay, that is not connected to our own source of existence. Can you guys all follow me? I will, I'll make examples here in a little bit, but I want you to really understand the char this characteristic of that specific darkness is whenever we lose ourselves in the outside, we are trying to find something outside of ourselves, the source of which brought us into existence. Okay, it's more or less trying to play God. Yeah, that is what we typically call Luciferian. And that is the one type of darkness that we all have to contend with. It's in us and around us. Yeah, we'll go through the examples here really quick. On the other side of that, and this is a term that many of you have never even heard before, is the Aramonic. Ariman is the original Satan, is the original, you know, Persian darkness, anti-God, okay, that tried to dominate humans through dehumanizing them, through pulling them into their own greed, into their own animalistic nature, into their beast, into their narcissism into their egotism and this is the part here that that's why this distinction is so important that we need to understand about darkness because both of these darknesses one that pulls us outside to, to the outside that makes us get lost on the outside maybe through seeking maybe through people pleasing maybe through complying conforming maybe through mysticism maybe through escapism maybe through drugs maybe to, those are all attempts of our own ego to escape our reality outside of ourselves or to pull us into our own little microcosm into the, the self ego god if you will that little ego kingdom, that uh, narcissistic uh, greed and exploitation of others and, you know, uh, wanting to accumulate more, getting, having, owning, yeah, uh, reducing ourselves to a machine, to a functioning, like a computer almost, that uh, denies or that despises imperfection that sees the world as something um, that uh, revolves around us and that needs to be, you know, you know, sort of without any kind of satiation that needs to be milked, that needs to be, you know, yeah, exploited. 
Yona, are you, uh, uh, am I feeling this right that Luciferian is externalized and Aramaic, how do you say that, is internalized? Well, not internalized uh, or externalized, but those are definitely the parts of the trajectory that happens here. And that's what makes it a lot easier also to understand it. So the Aramanic, the uh, materialism, okay, and uh, uh, fixating, uh, trying to overcome our own immortality through, you know, f forming crutches yeah, that create an illusion of security or an illusion of immortality. Yeah, you guys, you get, you guys can see those pictures in your head, right? I mean, through the centuries, the millennia, you know, where people, the emperors, pharaohs, uh, presidents, or whatever, who have tried to make themselves immortal. Um, okay, they belong to that category. All right, uh, that's what the, the Arimanic does. It reduces, it fixates on the 3Dness of ourselves, okay, and uh, forces us to come up with coping mechanisms that uh, produce the illusion of immortality. Whereas the Luciferian uh, doesn't even uh, go there. The Luciferian uh, denies the the. Uh, the, the internal self and, and, and the way, you know, the fact that we exist and how we exist, the fact that we are human in a different way, it does use externalization, but what it tries to find uh, on the outside is sort of an escape route. It's like I'm, I'm going into, my, into an alternate reality. I'm going into an alternate universe, into a different dimension. Yeah, spiritualism, New Age uh, is is full of that okay to uh, to completely sort of lose yourselves in others or in a world in an alternate uh, kind of reality yeah so yes the trajectory uh shell is internal and external the extremes of that yeah it's the obsession the fixation on something outside of myself or on just you know myself yeah, so uh, the, the, the Arimanic is the materialism, the fixation on self, and therefore, you know, also the, the, all these attributes uh, that come with that greed and so forth. Uh, here is a huge, big list, okay, of uh, these, <clears throat> these forms of darkness uh, that, uh, that can be classified as uh, Luciferian or Arimanic. Yeah, you can you can make that distinction. What kind of darkness is that right away? And then that's what I wanted to practice with you guys here. Um, uh, Cheryl, you're asking a question uh, uh, that I don't quite understand. You're asking, do all humans have Luciferian tendencies? I asked that question before you started talking about, uh, sorry, the one that starts with A. So I, I see the difference now. Yeah, uh, okay, Ariman is, and there's a, there's a reason why I keep uh, using this name, okay, because uh, in <clears throat> uh, when you learn how to do uh, uh, this kind of etheric work, okay, you learn very quickly that one of the biggest powers that you have is to name darkness, and when you name darkness, you thwart it, okay, you lose your fear of it, you uh, de-energize it, so to speak, and uh, uh, you learn um, how to drive it out. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and we discussed this right in the beginning, is that out, uh, that darkness exists uh, outside and inside of us, okay? And therefore also the different kinds of darkness. So it is quite possible that somebody can get pulled into both the Luciferian and Aramonic at the same time. Yeah, it, it, uh, you see this uh, uh, very clearly in, uh, say, cults, uh, th that are based on narcissism, exploitation, and you know, creating your own kingdom, but at the same time using sort of spiritual um, uh, uh, concepts around that. Yeah, the chosen ones and so forth. Okay, there's uh, many different forms um, that uh, where, where these overlap. Okay, but what they all have in common, and this is uh, here, this list here, yeah, is the absence of empathy, the absence of 
a form von, form of inner peace the absence of connection there is an absence of introspection you know like this the self awareness piece this consciousness piece that we all have and an inability to feel what oneness within yeah one requires a constant feeding from the outside and the other one um, requires uh, us to lose ourselves in the outside there's also an absence of clarity There's, both have that in common yeah there's an absence of insight and wisdom to freedom and love altogether both both kinds of darknesses are void of that of these attributes uh, also and this is a lot of stronger in the aramanic a lack of humanness yeah this dehumanization that we experience right now and a lot of other phenomena in our societies are very aramanic they're materialistic they reduce us to functioning units to machines to computers almost even in our legal system uh, reduces uh, uh, our existence uh, just by the definition of what life is down to our brain function okay that is a very restrictive way of defining what a human is and what human life is just on a side note here this is extremely important so that we see this critically mm -hmm. when when we can see all of these attributes in in entire well let's use political let's say political agendas or whatever so each of these things is driven f from the individuals within that system or is it bigger than that is is can you the, can you the stop the questioning stop the question your question can you can you ask more directly what is it what that you want to know uh, i want to know say let's say in the in the political if there's system, people out there that drive that Yeah, like is it is it by an overall force that pulls the people into it or is it the people that cause the force itself or is it a mixture of both? It's both. It's not a mixture. It's like it's the it's the actual duality of it. Yeah. And, and there's a reason why I uh, mentioned the um the Lord of the Rings in the beginning because it has uh, elements of it uh, that show this clearly, yeah, uh, how somebody gets pulled into darkness. There is many different ways how to get pulled into darkness, okay? And it's not all because people are evil, okay? Uh, so there are some, uh, sometimes karmic aspects to that. There's, uh, uh, you know, there's seduction, the animalistic part, there's trauma involved, there's uh, mental illness. So there can be many different factors that we've discussed already involved in, 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 in why a person um, falls for the dark, but the, The main reasons are here, the absence of empathy, the absence of connection, yeah? And uh, what that does, the states that it creates, namely the states of separation, an inner schism, an inner polar polarity, a dualism, a mentalism, yeah? A dissonance, it, 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 it brings extremes and ambiguities into existence within a person and that is basically the wedge um, that uh, separates us from our light and in that way which is a realm obviously it's a scale okay uh, we can be susceptible to darkness inner and outer darkness it's an interaction we constantly interact with light and dark Yeah, and so the expressions of darkness that we see manifested in, in our societies, uh, in certain people, in certain uh, groups, organizations, governments, or, you know, celebrities or, or personalities, okay? Uh, you know, the, you can say, ah, oh, this is uh, the devil we incarnate, okay? But you can also... Uh, see these people as uh, humans, okay, that uh, got pulled into their own inner darkness to the point where they got so sucked in that they no longer are able to see that. They're no longer able to choose. And this is the part here that where the, the true spiritual discussion 
um, begins <laughs> yeah here where we are uh, time where we start running out of time now we're starting to talk okay but first we have to really understand how darkness shows okay and it shows in things such as materialism and relativism coldness nihilism and exploitation blind faith as well and fanaticism escapism dippiness and mystification those are very clear expressions manifestations of darkness in people okay uh, and in an even even simpler way okay we can feel darkness through the presence of lies or not just feel see it uh, deceit trickery cheating elusiveness gaslighting betrayal laziness projection propaganda manipulation control power games yeah and uh, some of of these uh, sort of cardinal sins or uh, you know uh, whatever the, you know the, the, the religious uh, uh, co you know connotation is you know or meaning is but greed envy anger specialness superiorism narcissism self-loathing fixation seeking and externalization those are all things that pull us into our own darkness and therefore make us more susceptible to outer darkness so both exist at the same time inner and outer darkness there are realms okay just as the light yes julian you're absolutely right in uh, in all these comments that you make here okay so these these two darknesses that exist okay we stand right between them in the middle okay on one hand it's the coldness the animalistic part of us and we've discussed that earlier when we examined the ego all right it is the ego does play a role with it and that's why the ego can be perceived as dark in us because it has that cold that animalistic uh, nature to it yeah it can seduce us into doing things that are not uh you know nice if you will or not healthy that are degrading degrading to ourselves and others but that can also be quite materialistic yeah and and uh, mentalism is very cold in its nature you know so th there was uh, th th these these this first sort of type of darkness here the aramonic is something that we are surrounded by guys every day and most of our societies actually follow you know those uh, kind of paradigms the second kind of darkness the the fantastical the blind faith the escapism the spiritual laziness um, um, that we see forming right now uh, especially you know through new age and, and all the conspiracy theories and so forth it, it has always been there but in our times today you know it finds that that outlet in uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> simplistic unreflected spiritualism okay back in the days it was in, in sort of unreflected uh, organized uh, 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 you know churches and so forth but we have to understand that not that the church is dark but that the powers uh, that you know pull us into these things that these are dark forces that's what we have to understand because they both foster and cultivate specialness and ego in this in us and every time uh, this ego specialness uh, yeah and uh, some of the the uh, addictions and the, the traits that come with that gets triggered in us uh, we are no longer connected to truth. We are unable to feel truth, to discern truth. That's why Ariman, the actual uh, translation, means the lie, the lie, the deceit, the trickster. Okay, um, is something that uh, often comes in disguise. So the dark often disguises itself as the good okay and because we lack the ability to discern truth and allow ourselves to get seduced into our lower vibratory more animalistic and reactive states that are not actually um, controllable by our higher thinking but our uh, central nervous system 
they are the fodder. They are what form the foundation for, or the the food, the you know the energy yeah, for darkness. And so Jesse, uh, to come back to your initial statement, um, I do agree with you to a certain degree, but um, it is not so not uh, mature. Uh, to say that everything that is ego equals dark, okay? Because our ego has a function and we all know that we have these states. We are temporary, pulled in states here, you know, shame, guilt, pain, fear, anger, uh, disdain, resentment, judgment, control, and specialness, and so forth that uh, we have to contend with as humans. And those are, if we, and this is really subject here to uh, self-healing, those are states that can be healed. So healed uh, in, in the sense of uh, where uh, the connection uh, within can be reinstated. Uh, healing always means to up the vibratory rate from a lower into a higher state relative to the lower state. So somebody can experience feeling um, a healing from uh, by moving from depression into anxiety, for instance, because uh, uh, that state is more, you know, the, the state of anxiety is slightly more powerful than depression is, uh, which is also why so many of us, once we work through our anxiety, uh, suddenly feel so much anger. and. Uh, really, the trick here with all of this is to learn how to handle these different states and how to um, get ourselves connected again so that we can discern again, that we can feel truth and then learn to let all them go. So as soon as we are, as we have arrived in truth, um, th this connection to the light within ourselves, yeah, so light and truth are connected with another Truth always comes with an illumination, with an insight, okay, that is, um, that can form in inside of us. It's a choice that we have, okay? Truth always comes with a choice. Ego states don't come with a choice, yeah? They feel very over overpowering and frightening um, and something that we often uh, really don't want to feel into. But self-healing is really characterized by uh, not being afraid of those states uh, and really working with them, because as we are doing that, we're literally inoculating ourselves from darkness. Okay, so uh, the reason why we we do divide our uh, different energetic states into these uh, two sort of, you know, ego and true self states is just for simplicity. But really what they mean is that um, anything here, uh, truth and above, uh, has a self-illuminating, self-propelling and expansive nature and everything um, below truth has a self-degrading and restricting nature and therefore pulls us deeper into our own darkness. Yeah, And the more we get pulled into our own darkness, the more we resonate on the same frequency as outer darkness. So the answer to your question, Cheryl, isn't that simple. It's both, it's a constant interaction. Yeah, so the lower our uh, energetic state, the more we will resonate with outer darkness. In other way, uh, in, in simple words, um, you know, this is uh, really what we need to pay attention to because when we get pulled into these dark inner states, okay, we are staring into the abyss. And if we stay there for too long, we get pulled into the abyss. Yeah, Jesse, that's very beautiful. You, you, Jesse is sharing, he's, he just had a huge revel, uh, realization that uh, a huge realization I have had is that I lack inner integrity. So inner integrity is something that allows us to discern and uh, integrity is something that we have to practice. We have to train that, all right? It's simply because our outer environment, and that's why I wanted to make you guys aware of, you know, literally the, not in a conspiracy theory, but the presence of darkness all around us, okay? So if we are, if we don't do anything, if we just sort of go with the flow and stay on autopilot, guys, we will get pulled into darkness. 
simply because that's what we are exposed to for the majority. And integrity is the piece in us that reminds us um, of, uh, you know, our choice of our will uh, not to go there. Okay, so integrity is something that comes from within and it cannot come from the outside. Okay, maybe at a state uh, 2000 years ago when the overall level of consciousness of humanity wasn't high enough for people to actually um, develop the power uh, of integrity. They had to be told, you know, through the Ten Commandments or whatever, what's right and wrong. But we are here at the precipice of an, an unexperienced, you know, a new char uncharted territory, namely us becoming aware that we actually have a choice and that truth is a power that we have. So, Jesse, do not judge yourself for that. On the contrary, the mere fact that you have that uh, insight, that you have this awareness now, already sets you above your ego, okay? Because the, the ego part in us cannot say that. When we are in our ego states, we are unable to see that. We are unable to detect the lack of integrity, the lack of connection, the lack of truth, the lack of freedom, okay? It isn't until we have that awareness and that's where it all starts, guys. And this is the huge power and opportunity that we have as active self-healers. Because through all these things that we are cultivating here, we are learning how to do this. We are becoming aware of our own states and the needs that come with this, yeah? Needs also in, in regards to, you know, behaviors that we have to form, disciplines that we have to form, yeah? We connect with all our sensations, perceptions, and feelings, and no longer deny the, you know, say the, the, the ugly parts, okay? Because we recognize that they're all part of being human and that wholeness and, and you know, that us seeing ourselves as an integrous being with all the darkness being a part of that is the most important realization so we have to invite and integrate all these things back in and we have to learn how to discern truths yes we have to accept the limitations that we have when we are in our ego and on the other side become aware of our power to overcome that within ourselves yeah we, we get to the powers we can learn how to question our perception and stop questioning ourselves. That is a form of darkness. It drives us into the abyss, guys. All right? Whereas most of us just suffer from an um, illusion uh, that has to do with uh, our perception, yeah, with a lack of training, really. Okay? Uh, we don't need to question ourselves. We just need to question our perception. We just need to realize that our ego mind in and of itself is not able to transcend itself and that we can't trust anything really that we perceive we have to go deeper we have to feel into it we have to ask our heart not our emotions but our heart you know, and combine our higher thinking and our feeling so that we can integrate this okay here comes the word again and uh, and, and step into action embody it okay that's by the way why i made such a big deal out of this embodiment energy uh, at the moment, yeah, that we have to understand, we have to understand what it means so that we can do the steps necessary to to actually um, manifest that, yeah. We do this by, by practicing how to be present in the moment and not to go into autopilot. Guys, if you're asking me what makes most people dark, yeah, or get pulled into their darkness, it's the fact that most people just go on autopilot. They're robotic already. They're just following sort of the, the whole sort of sheeple hive mind kind of thing and just trying to get by. That is something that pulls us into our darkness because it disconnects us. It, it makes it impossible for us to be in the present moment and to develop and cultivate insight. Insight is defined by our ability to freely think and to use the power of our consciousness, which can witness, we can experience and observe at the same time, yeah, and allow us to come to our own conclusion. That's a power that we have as a human. Yeah. 
there are some other things that sort of overlap with psychology here. Uh, you know, there are necessities in, in, uh, on our past uh, of self-discovery and self-healing. We need to increase our emotional literacy and our communication, learn to, how to express ourselves more clearly and more authentically. Yeah, we need to learn how to balance masculine and feminine energies, uh, more or less the, uh, the sort of the physical uh, manifestation of our human duality within. Okay, we have to learn how to cultivate firm boundaries and enforce them. Now, not just think them, also do them and not shy away from confrontation, not shy away from making a stance for ourselves. Yeah, it's all courage that we need to develop here. Uh, but I tell you what, if you know what I know, uh, then courage is no big deal because you know what waits uh, for you if you don't step out of this, if you don't enforce them because you get pulled into your own darkness. Know your values and your integrity. That is the, the, the consequence of us doing all these things. So Jesse, don't judge yourself or anybody out there you know, uh, recognizing that you don't have a lot of integrity, how, how could you? Okay, it's integrity comes from the ability to discern truth, the ability to feel love and empathy, and really feeling, yeah, from within discerning what is true and what isn't. That is ultimately then um, how our integrity expresses, yeah, that we just simply no longer interested in engaging with things or uh, exposing ourselves to things that um, uh, uh, compromise that. Why would we? Yeah, it's precious to us. It's sacred, our integrity. We've worked for this, okay? And it is our birthright. It is our sovereignty that we have as human beings. A huge power, guys. A huge power and it's their protection. You'll see that that is your big, one of your biggest powers, yeah? fighting against dark forces. We need to learn how to acknowledge our own delusions and attachments and free ourselves from it. And this is, isn't easy. This is where the ego addictions come into play. Yeah? Find healthier expressions for our lower states. The fact that we have lower states doesn't make us dark. But if we get stuck in them, that's when we have to be careful. That's when we get pulled into our darkness. Yeah, when we start to loathe them, when we do, or, or exploit them, when we start to milk them. Yeah, when we when we throw pity parties for ourselves, when uh, we uh, start milking our victimhood and the injustice. That's when we are in our in our darkness, guys. We need to find better ways to nurture ourselves because self-love ultimately is the currency with which we nurture truth and empathy, yeah, the big powers that we have. So the self-nurturing, self-love, all expressions of self-love are extremely powerful, guys. Um, we need to slow down our activity because we all have an amygdala. And just so you know, uh, studies clearly show this uh, just two weeks of regular meditation, yeah, 15, 20 minute meditation a day, uh, reduces the size of your amygdala, reduces your reactivity and your central nervous system response, okay? Uh, all those of you who, who suffer from insomnia and adrenal fatigue, okay? Uh, this isn't uh, spiritual, this is, a, <laughs> this is very scientific, very physiological, yeah? Mindfulness does work, okay? find abundance or creative outlook outlet for things because uh, cre creativeness and beauty beautification um, link us into abundance and heal this uh, inherent uh, fear of of scarcity and and lack yeah so cre creativity is uh, one of these beautiful ways for us to overcome fears scarcity do consciousness work with yourself all these things that we uh, uh, consistently uh, or um, frequently discuss here in these workshops and also the online meditations that we have every day guys that is extremely valuable work for yourself you may not be able to see this but those of you who come regularly to those daily 
free meditations, who come to the transmissions and the uh, the intensives and so forth, the energy awareness trainings, who do the steps regularly, you guys have a whole different standing in the etheric and you're much more powerful in your energy than uh, people who think uh, that have uh, have it, you think they have it figured out because they've read a few things, okay? No, it's about the doing and the embodying yeah, of our consciousness and that's basically what I call consciousness work. So make everything a conscious choice. Yeah. Yeah, well, Jesse, it took you three years to get to this point and you're proud of the work that you've done. And yes, that you should be. Okay. To have your own insights, to be willing and able to do honest self-reflection and self-inquiry is a power and that power is called truth yeah to learn how to be in truth with ourselves including the good and the bad and the ugly yeah and integrate it and form oh that's remember the wholeness that we originally were before we got separated yeah is the pathway to healing and every insight we have on this way is something that we can be proud of. It doesn't make us special, but it makes us more powerful and it becomes sacred in this way. And that's why consciously choosing means consciously living in truth, guys, living in light at all times. That's why the simple answer to how can I overcome darkness, inner or outer darkness, is that simple. You have to consciously choose to wanting to be in the light. And that is your biggest power. The freedom of choice. The free will you have to either align yourself to dark or to light. And that no force, not even the divine, can violate that. No matter what religious understanding you have or spiritual understanding, completely irrelevant. You have to understand what your self-healing powers are. And these powers cannot be taken away from you. They cannot be compromised. They cannot be violated by no one and nobody in no dimension or time. Not even the divine. You have free will. And it is your choice. And in the etheric, no choice is also a choice. Do you guys know what not choosing, what kind of choice that is? In this world, if you're not consciously choosing, where does your energy go? Not choosing means going on autopilot, going you know, with what, with the flow, with what everybody else does. If you don't consciously choose what you align yourself to or what you want to embody, what it is that you are showing up as, somebody else will or something else will for you. If you're not consciously choosing, guys, with the way our environment is today, this is changing. We're at the precipice of humanity arriving in truth, which means from then on, okay, the consciousness level of, of humanity altogether is high enough to become an expansive and conducive environment for the light 
But right now we're sitting right on that seesaw, right in the middle. Yeah, and that is the choice that we have to do. We have to choose the center. We have to choose to stand between it all and to allow it to be part of us, but not to be it. We need to know what we are aligned to, what we are choosing, what it is that we are going for. We need to know what we're doing. We don't need to be perfect. We don't need to be the best. We just need to know what we're doing. We just need to know what we've chosen. And if you're not sure what you're choosing, yeah, then go back to the list. Yeah, to this list here. Yeah. These are your choices. A part of the dual, du duality of being human is that we have these elements here that we are exposed to, which means they do come in and they are a part of us. Okay, so yes, fear is part of being in the light, but it can be transcended in the light. When it's in the dark, it cannot be transcended. It leads to all these other ego, you know, crutches, these addictions. So you have the Aramanic here on this side, the coldness, the, the materialism, the narcissism, the reducing, yeah, the dehumanizing, the de reducing life force to something that needs to function as something quantifiable. And you have the other darkness that pulls you out of yourself into the specialness of the mystical, of the elusive, of, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the alternative reality, the other kingdom, the Luciferi. And the light is right in the middle. It's your sacred heart. Yeah, your sacred heart is right in the middle. And when you're in that center, you are untouchable. You're untouchable, powerful, eternal, and infinite. And no, nothing and nobody, no entity can question that. And there are uh, certain techniques that we can learn on the way. Uh, to train, we can train that, okay, to withstand that actively. And some of us choose, like Justine, like Julianne, to be of service in this way. This is my mission. My mission is to allow people to understand these things and to learn the techniques to with actively withstand that. But most and foremost, if you look at all my work, it's about how to remember to choose the light and where to find the light. This isn't about wearing red socks and being a vegan and doing yoga or any of these things. I never talk about these things other than, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of a critical way. Not that I'm against it. I have red socks and I like yoga. <laughs> I'm not a vegan, I'm a vegetarian, but those are not, not never things that I recommend you to do. Okay, what I recommend you to do is to go into self-responsibility, is to make every choice a conscious choice, is to align yourself to truth, is to work with what freedom truly means, to align yourself to abundance. And all these things that come with this, the clarity and the peace and the wholeness and the empathy, those are your powers, guys. And these, happen to be the same powers that I mentioned in our April forecast and uh, the, the roundup here of April energies as the, the powers of being or becoming human, the power of truth, the power of insight, the power of choice, of freedom and of love. Once you are aware that that is what expresses your sovereign soul self, you understand the true nature of darkness and something that Julian has mentioned 
in our realm. Namely, that darkness fulfills a purpose. And this is the hardest part for our dualistic mind to understand because we see darkness as sort of the anti-light. Okay. Reality is that when we cast light onto something, we also producing a shadow. It's the flip side of the coin. It's the... Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't want to go into science here, but you will find that uh, you know, with matter as well. We have the matter and we have the anti-matter. We have the plus and the minus, all right? So in in this universe, everything comes in form of this duality, yeah, in this 3D universe. And we have to learn how to live with that. We have to learn to find that middle ground where we are not affected by either of the extremes. So it is not about right or wrong, or here or there, or if you are uh, not for me, then you just got you got to be against me. That binary way that is not very sophisticated. It shows a very low level of consciousness. It is about recognizing that everything is like a realm, and that it more acts like a field, and that the trajectory in, in, in which we send our energy that that determines our attractions and our resonances or our dissonances. So it's in a constant flux and it, it can oscillate a little bit. In fact, there is a very strong, uh, very powerful uh, sort of uh, creative uh, energy in, in a little bit of chaos, okay? Yeah, creative chaos is a, is a very invigorating and renewing energy. But it's always about maintaining the balance, maintaining the harmony between all these, these, these different dualities in us. So as soon as you get pulled into an extreme, you are losing your integrity. And that is really what it comes down to. So when you get pulled into a really, really dark place, guys, oh, you need to remember is that you're human, that you are a soul with a body, that you have a sovereignty as a soul, and that sovereignty guarantees you the freedom of choice, the freedom of, cho of truth, the freedom of love, the freedom of insight. And your job is to execute them, is to embody them. And when you get caught in these really, really dark places, then all you gotta do is remember that. Remember your light and what it actually is that you are jeopardizing. This is way more than you think it is. This isn't just about being perfect or, you know, having addictions, this is more. You are playing with your light. You are playing with darkness and that at some point gets so seductive and so heavy that you will not be able to get yourself out of there. This is when people like I come in or Jeff or people, healers, who dedicate themselves to helping people to pull them out of these places. Yeah, but you all can do this yourself if you understand what it takes, what it's needed to execute and to embody that power of being human. Yes. Beautiful, Jesse, how you're sharing this here in, in your commentary throughout. Knowing this lack of integrity has given me the choice to choose differently. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. There's a remembrance that comes in. Yeah, so you understand the lack of your integrity and what does that do? It reminds you that there's something sacred about that integrity, that light of yours. It is indeed sacred and it's extremely powerful. So your fear of darkness comes from a place 
of lack of knowledge. Yeah. And this is why I've taken it on, you know, here as a as a sort of spiritual teacher and somebody who goes, you know, sort of semi-public with this, to educate people on the nature of the darkness and the light and bring back that remembrance to all of you. So yes, we have to come to an end. Um, you can go deeper into this. Um, uh, check the Truth Talks on YouTube, uh, where I go a little deeper into light forces and dark forces. Uh, one of those are with Jeff together, uh, where we talk a little bit about, uh, you know, exorcism and, and how this works. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, Justine mentioned something in the beginning. She said that she drove out darkness, this dark entity encounter that she had through making this dance for herself. Guys, when you make a conscious choice, when you remember your light, that is when you become powerful in the etheric, okay? And if you do, can't trust in your own light, or if you don't think you have enough light, then call in the forces of light, whichever those are that you've aligned yourself. Yeah, call in Grace, call in God, call in Archangel Michael, call in whatever feels intuitively strengthening and empowering to you. Okay? Because that informs. Yeah, the powers that are about where you're from. And as a human, yeah, as a soul, as a divine soul with a human body, your faction is the light. How can I say this? Because you exist, and that is something that your soul chose to do. Existence is the proof of light. Never question your light. The fact that you exist is the proof that you are from light. But in this 3D form, due to our nervous system, our protoplasm, our psychology, our ego, we get to experience the dualism of what it means to be human. That too is a choice. And darkness is here to help us calibrate, to help us become more clear about what it is that we are. As humans, we are more or less angels in the making. Who knows? Maybe it's our master certification <laughs> to become an angel. Quite possible. That just as a little inspiration here as I'm letting you go. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for forgiving me for always going over time. As you can tell, I get very passionate about our discussions, especially about your questions and your sharing. It's very, very important to me. So yes, I usually go over time. Yes, wonderful to be here with you. It's a it's an honor and a privilege, and I don't take this lightly that you just spent two hours with me here. I honor that. So, yeah, come back. Uh, maybe if you have questions and so forth, I will post this in the Secrets of Healing forum as always. And um, you know, most of you know where to reach me on Skype or email if you want to inquire about the deeper aspects of some of the things that we covered here today. Bye-bye.